All right, hello and welcome to uh, chapter one of uh, this course. So chapter one is just a very basic introductory uh, chapter to economics. Um, and it's entitled the nature of economics. And uh, so we're just going to learn some of the most fundamental concepts that are important. Uh, they underlie all of economics and, and then the study of economics. So uh, it's a very important chapter, um, even though the, the concepts are fundamental and basic, it's important that you understand them so that you can move forward and, and continue to understand uh, newer material that's more complex. Okay, so um, here's some food for thought to sort of kick us off here. Um, did you know that the percentage of women who are aged between 40 and 44 years old who have medical or doctoral degrees uh, who are also childless, that percentage has fallen from 35% 20 years ago, probably almost 25 years ago now, to around 20% today. So in other words, the number of women who are between 40 and 44 with higher educations who don't have children, there are fewer of them today than there used to be. Um, so in other words, uh, another way to think about it is that uh, more women that fall into that category of being 40 to 44 with higher education, more of them are having children. Um, so believe it or not, this is an economic issue. Um, this is this is a question or uh, something that we can study with economics so uh, a good question for you right now is what are some things that you think uh, account for this increase in the willingness of these types of women to have children um so i invite you to take a minute uh or two to think about that think about what might be causing that um, and go ahead and tell us in the discussion forum why you think these women, uh, these types of women, the, these women that fall into this category, uh, more of them are having children. Or in other words, less of them are childless. Um, so take a minute to think about it. Uh, make a post in the discussion forum. Um, and that's what we'll basically, this is a question we'll be exploring throughout this entire chapter. So keep this in mind as we move forward. Okay. Um, so we'll start every chapter by first just thinking about the objectives, what we want to learn from this chapter. Uh, so in this chapter, we want to be able to define what economics is and discuss the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Um, after that, we will look at three basic economic questions and sort of two different ways to think about answering those questions, two methodologies or approaches to answering those questions. Um, after that, in section three, we will evaluate the role of rational self-interest um, and, and what role that plays in economic analysis. Okay, so uh, this is basically an underlying assumption in economics that people are rationally self-interested. Um, Maybe as a challenge to you, try to convince me that, uh, and the class that we are not <laughs> rationally self-interested beings. Um, that might be good discussion post uh, material. Uh, after that, we will talk about why economics is in fact a science. It's a, it's a social science, so it's not exactly like uh, some of the hard sciences like physics and chemistry. Um, but we do still use the economic, uh, I'm sorry, the scientific method uh, of, of exploration. Um, and so, believe it or not, economics is a science, and we'll talk about why. Uh, and then we'll wrap up the chapter with a discussion of the difference between positive and normative economics or positive and normative uh, analysis. So, um, again, keep in mind these are all important things to learn and understand moving forward. So make sure you're paying attention. Um, 
and that you're reviewing this material carefully so that you understand all of these things and have no issues moving forward through the course. Uh, and here's the chapter outline. Um, basically just titles of, of uh, the objectives. All right, so here's some other questions for you to think about. Um, did you know that married people are typically healthier on average? Um, that young people with good health are more likely they have a higher probability of getting married? Um, did you know that married couples may benefit from a quote unquote protective effect of better health? Um, so what does that mean to you? I think that what that means is that, uh, when you're married to someone, you, you have an incentive to, um, maintain better health for yourself because you may be to some degree or another, uh, responsible for the person that you're married to, right. Um, whether it's, uh, with income or, um, some other mode of production, household production, right? Doing laundry and, and taking care of the kids and so forth. Um, being married provides extra incentive uh, for people to be healthier. So I think that's what the, uh, we mean here by protective effect of better health. Um, so really what we're getting at here, uh, and I even used this word in, in talking about the last bullet point, but uh, what we will be talking about uh, a lot in economics in this class are um, incentives and how people respond to incentives okay because this is a class economics is about behavior um, it's a behavioral science and uh, incentives are a huge part of that so uh, we'll be talking a lot about incentives um, so we need to make sure we understand what incentives are right so um, I'm sure you've heard the word before. You have some idea about what uh, incentives means. Um, but uh, just to be ultra clear, uh, let's go over it, right? So an incentive is simply a reward um, or a punishment, in fact. So I would add that here. The slide says reward, but it could also be a punishment um, for engaging in a particular activity. So uh, take a moment to think about some different types of incentives that you're aware of in the world, uh, whether they're incentives for your own behavior or uh, somebody you know, uh, or society in general. Um, I'm sure you should have no problem thinking uh, of at least a handful of, of different types of incentives that people face uh, in our world. Um, and as I mentioned, rational self-interest is a huge part of economic analysis. So as rationally self-interested beings, we will respond to incentives. Um, your incentive to learn in this class, one of them is to earn a grade. Another incentive to learn in this class is to have a higher level of knowledge, uh, a higher level of intelligence. Another uh, incentive for you to learn uh, this material or any material that for that matter is to uh, be able to get a job that pays more money, right? So these are all different incentives for uh, your learning in this class or any other class uh, or in life in general. Um, now, all of those are basically positive incentives, which are rewards. Um, I guess there are some negative incentives embedded in there. If you don't learn, you will fail the class. And maybe that means you'll lose uh, some scholarship money or, or something else like that. That would be a negative incentive uh, for you to learn. So um, there are different types and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a second, but that's the, that's the idea behind incentives. Um, so really what we're talking about here is um, an economic way of thinking, right? It's a framework. Um, it's a way of thinking about the world around us uh, so that we can analyze uh, and perhaps create solutions to economic problems. Uh, so things like um, how much time do I spend studying for this class? Um, how do I choose which course to take or which courses? Um, what should the U.S. government do uh, about immigration um, or <laughs> 
what should the U.S. government do about uh, the coronavirus? Right? Um, they, the government's facing a lot of hard um, questions right now. Um, they are all economic in nature, and I guarantee that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of economists working together alongside with uh, government officials, science, scientists, um, medical scientists, um, policymakers of all sorts, uh, working together to figure out how to deal with this uh, situation we're in. So. Um, economics is a, is a framework or a way of thinking about the world so that we can try to analyze and tackle these, these sorts of problems. So very relevant. Right. And, um, you know, it's not even, <laughs> it's not only useful in, in these large scale, uh, extreme types of events and times, um, it can also be incredibly useful in your just every day to day, uh, simple life. Um, it helps you be more informed about what's going on in the world. Um, it helps you make better decisions, whether it's, um, about what job to take and where, um, when to get married, uh, whether or not to buy a house, right? All these sorts of things. Um, you're going to make better decisions if you have, um, uh, this economic framework, this way of thinking about things, it's, it's only going to help you make better decisions in your life. Okay. Um, you know, like I mentioned, these can be decisions about your career, your education, right. Um, your involvement in the business world, even how you cast your vote, right. Um, the voting box, the ballot box is incredibly economic in terms of decision making and incentives and all kinds of things. Right. So, um, think about what motivates you to vote. If you vote at all, think about why maybe you don't vote, what motivates you to not vote. Right. Um, think about all these different things. Um, what are the incentives there behind your, your actions? Right. Um, everything you do is driven by some kind of incentive. So you should be able to start, uh, becoming aware of a little bit more aware of your reality and what, what are the things motivating your behavior? Okay. So I'd like you to think about that, um, as we continue through the course. Now, as far as what economics is defined as, um, it may seem a little disconnected from kind of what we've been talking about with incentives and behavior. Um, but hopefully, uh, you will realize very shortly that, um, this definition of economics is actually directly related to incentives and behavior, but, uh, in any case, so, uh, economics, uh, strictly defined is the study of how people or organizations, agencies, governments allocate their, un, uh, their limited resources, sorry, their, their limited resources, uh, to satisfy their unlimited wants or objectives. Um, very basically speaking, it's the study of how people or these agencies, governments, uh, organizations make choices. So there's your behavior, behavioral part. Um, and of course the incentives are the things that are driving, uh, the behavior, driving people or organizations to the choices that they make. Okay. So that's economics. Um, now let's just be clear about a few of those other words we used in the definition of economics. Uh, first of all, we need to make sure we understand what resources are in the context of this class. Um, and resources are simply things, anything that's used to produce other things that satisfy people's wants. Um, so we don't want the resources themselves necessarily. We want what they can produce. Um, so. Um, you know, uh, for example, probably the most basic resource is time. Um, if I want to have a birdhouse, I could build one utilizing as one resource, my time. Another resource I would need is wood, um, and some nails, right? I don't want the nails or the wood by itself. Um, what I want is what those things put in combination together can create, which is the birdhouse, right? 
So uh, the nails, the wood, the time, the labor is the time, um, right? The hammer that I use, the glue, whatever else I need, the paint. Those are all resources, right? Um, I don't want them by themselves. I want what they can turn into when they are brought together, right? So uh, that's what you should think of resources as. Now, as far as wants, this is where it gets a little bit more abstract perhaps, but a want is basically a thing that you would buy if you had unlimited resources or unlimited income. Um, So for example, I would never spend money purposefully getting the flu. So the flu is not a want, right? Uh, The flu virus or the coronavirus is not a want. Um, But um, I would love to take a vacation in Thailand. Can I do that? Not currently. I don't have the the resources or the income to do that. Um, But it is a want. If I had unlimited money, I would do it. I would go to to Thailand and take a vacation. Um, But that's how we define wants in economics. It's anything that you would buy if you had unlimited income or resources. Um, Now, hopefully what you're seeing here and what I'm trying to uh, sort of subtly illustrate um, is that there's sort of a, um, there are opposing forces in the world. When it comes to decision making, um, there are wants that are essentially unlimited. And then there are resources which are used to create those uh, things that we want or provide those things that we want. Um, But those resources are limited. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, And so this is sort of the conundrum that we all face. It's the dilemma that we all face. We have limited resources and unlimited wants and these forces come together and they require us to make choices. Um, We have to make choices in order to utilize what we do have to get what we can obtain, what wants we can obtain, right? Um, So that's basically the nature of all of economics. Um, We will, you know, um, in terms of consumer theory, it's all about how consumers make themselves as well off as possible given a limited budget of income um, with firms um, and, and business organizations, they are trying to maximize profit given the limitations of some production technology. Um, governments are trying to achieve a social good uh, with limited tax money. <laughs> okay. So basically all the uh, types of economic analysis some way or another tie back into this idea that um, there's limited resources, unlimited wants, and these things have to be brought into balance. Okay. And like I just mentioned, right, individuals, businesses, nations all face uh, this decision uh, problem right? Uh, they all face limited resources and unlimited wants. Um, in other words, they face different alternatives. Um, and economics is a study of how choices, uh, in these realms are made. Um, now let's wrap up this, uh, first section here with, uh, a discussion of the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. So, As you may have guessed, um, microeconomics sort of is looking at the bigger picture through a microscope, right? Looking at the smaller pieces of the bigger picture. So uh, this is usually uh, the study of how individual consumers make decisions as well as how individual firms make decisions. That's that's the primary focus of microeconomics. And again, it's like looking at the large macro economy uh, through a microscope to focus on the smaller parts. So some examples of microeconomic topics are things like changes in the uh, price of gasoline, um, a family's choice to have a baby, uh, or a firm, a business's decision to advertise. Okay, so those are all examples of, of microeconomic topics. Okay. Um, 
Now, that doesn't mean that it's entirely separate from macro, right? So micro, in fact, lays the foundation for macroeconomics um, because micro is all about the smaller parts and the smaller parts make up the economy as a whole. Microeconomics is inherently tied to macroeconomics. And so uh, an example of that is, is the gig economy. So this is an interesting thing that's been a recent develop, uh, recent development in recent history um, is, is this sort of gig work like Uber um, and Grubhub, um, sort of on-demand um, jobs um, assisted by, you know, cell phone smartphone technology um the internet interconnectivity of our world um but um roughly a third of nearly uh, 160 million people received fixed payments for performing short-term tasks or gigs so this would be you know like working for uber uh, driving someone from one point to another um and the development of these types of um industries this gig economy has altered how people make decisions for lots of businesses and firms um, and as it turns out the expansion of the gig economy has contributed to a substantial rise in uh, the part-time share of employment so uh, unemployment and employment being a macro topic is directly tied to um, what's going in uh, to the decision process of individuals and firms, which is a micro, uh, a micro topic, micro uh, matters of study. So, uh, as you can see, these things are inherently tied. Okay, and, and this is an example of how they are tied together. Um, now, of course, hopefully, as you may have gav gathered by now, um, macroeconomics is the study of the economy as a whole, and it deals with um, phenomena that are economy wide they they are um in many cases aggregates which basically means summations or totals right so things like um, the national unemployment rate right taking the entire employment picture of the entire economy and looking at at it and, and seeing well how many people that want to work uh, want a job don't have one right that's the unemployment rate um, the rate of inflation, how quickly does our money become less valuable, right? Which basically translates into prices increasing, right? That's inflation. Um, but that's something that takes place uh, on a national level, right? We're talking about the price level, which is a measure of all prices in the economy. <clears throat> um, another uh, aggregate is the yearly output of goods and services which is what we will learn is a uh, gross domestic product or gdp right so again these are all things that are economy wide they are totals totaling up the entire economy it's the whole thing right so um but as i mentioned already today in economics and modern economics we are really blending mi both micro and macro even though they kind of um, can be compartmentalized and separated um, they really inherently depend on one another and, and really can't be separated, even though we look at them separately. Um, so uh, that concludes section one of chapter one. Uh, see you in the next section.